we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, I know it's homecoming week and there's probably a lot of other activities that you could have done, but we thank you for coming. Um, so I'll introduce uh, Michael Salisbury. Uh, he is a consultant engineer with Atkins Global uh, over in Titusville. Um, he graduated here at UCF with his bachelor's in 2003 in civil engineering and also in 2005 uh, with his master's in civil engineering. He was actually the first undergraduate research assistant uh, in this chance lab. So he goes back uh, from his very early time. There's a, a kind of combination of undergrad and grad students, uh, probably um, different career goals. Probably some of you that are undergrad want to go to grad school and beyond. So you want to finish undergrad and go to work in some form. Uh, and then grad students, you know, maybe you want to finish up grad school, school and keep going on in academia or get a consulting job. So since there's kind of like a broad mix of students, wasn't really too sure, no one's at the same place, I uh, kind of just wanted to talk about general tips that are really my own personal experiences along the way that worked for me. Um, I've had the fortune of getting to know some, some uh, very successful people in this field. And kind of with getting to know those people, I've, I've been able to kind of pick their brain along the way and kind of get a sense of, of what has seemed to work in general. If, you know, going out to the workforce, finding a job, being successful, building a career, uh, that sort of thing. To the end, I, I just want to kind of throw up this disclaimer. Um, these kind of tips that I'm going to show you are, are really just my own personal suggestions, advice, if you will. Like I said, it's mainly based off of my interactions and experiences thus far. You know, different uh, different church, different folks, feel free to, to ingest this as much as you want, ignore it, what have you. Uh, you know, different things work for different people. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think in general you'll probably find some, some things, hopefully, at least my hope is, just to give a brief overview, uh, I'm just going to give a, a relatively brief introduction of myself now since Magic did most of that a few minutes ago. Uh, then I'm going to kind of start through the life cycle of where you guys are at now. You guys are in the middle of your education experience. Uh, tips I have for you finishing out that, then next step, finding a job, then building a uh, successful career from that. Uh, after we kind of get through that, and I hope I won't bore you too much, uh, I actually have probably the, the bulk of the time of the, the me talking will be a couple project examples that are interesting projects that I've worked on. I hope you guys will find it interesting. Um, so hopefully it won't, it won't bore you too bad. As Matt said, I, I <laughs> am rooted in UCF. I am, I am all things UCF. I, I got my bachelor's degree here at UCF. I know three masters, you know, five uh, out of this lab, and my thesis and graduate research out of this lab. Uh, the concentration of water resources engineering uh, hits my specialization, if you will, and Along the way, while I was at UCF in my education, I was a combination of research and teaching assistants along the way. From that, when I immediately graduated, I actually started as a research scientist in this, in this lab, kind of continuing on research, publications, that kind of thing. Shortly after that, I actually started in consulting as a water resources engineer at Artemin Associates here in Orlando. Uh, while I was at Artemin, uh, kind of jointly, um, up until uh, recently, actually, about once a year, I was an adjunct instructor here. Um, I usually alternate once, a, usually in the summer, because that's when people like Dr. Hagen feel like they get a, a little bit of a break from teaching. Um, you know, I usually teach in the summer, usually.
actually alternate between one summer would be fluid mechanics, next summer would be hydrology, uh, which for you guys are undergrad, hydrology doesn't really exist for you as a standalone class anymore. I guess now with water resources engineering sequence. And then leads me to my current position as a uh, now coastal engineering team leader at Atkins. And jointly over the last few years I've been chair of the coastal and hydro science as very uh, coastal industry hydro science committee as part of COPRI. So as I said, you know, kind of to address where you guys are at now uh, with the educational experience, again, this is just my own thoughts. What I've typically seen, you know, with, with hydraulic engineering, hydroenvironmental sciences and engineering, is the degree that uh, really the more education it has, the better uh, for you. Um, it's one, it's typically a very specialized field. It even has subspecialties within the specialized field. Um, I know you probably have colleagues or peers of yours and maybe they're going to go do more kind of standard civil engineering, land development, that kind of stuff. Um, that kind of route, getting the advanced degrees isn't necessarily a benefit. Um, I have found in, in um, hydraulics, hydraulic engineering, coastal engineering, that kind of thing, um, having advanced degrees, uh, master, PhD, et cetera, is very helpful. I personally recommend at least a master's degree. Um, you know, it, it's a uh, specialize in this particular uh, career field, focusing your coursework on hydraulics or water resources, which fortunately, like I said, here at UCF, I believe you guys still have uh, your track in, in water resources engineering as a specialty. With that, a real big um, point of emphasis, I highly, highly, highly recommend doing the thesis option over the non-thesis option. The reason being is the thesis option is much more of a uh, Scenario. Um, I know it may not seem like it when you're doing it, but you're probably pissed off at your advisor for demanding too much from you or what have you. Uh, but believe it or not, there, there's some broader takeaways from doing a thesis. You're essentially a project manager. You're given a task that's months long, six months to a year, start date, end date, have to think through all the steps, you know, plan your work, work your plan, um, have to see it through, finish it, you have to write a thesis, so yeah, there's a large technical writing component to it, and you have to orally defend your thesis, so there's some oral presentation skills component to it. You don't get that in a non-thesis option. I think there's much more real-world value in doing a thesis option. Beyond the master's, you have a PhD. I know there's a lot of uh, grad students in this lab that are PhDs. I don't know how many um, other people here are currently on PhD track. For the most part, traditionally this has been required for academia or research this particular field, it's becoming more and more advantageous to have a PhD, even if you want to go to consulting. Uh, like I said, it kind of goes back to what I said before. This is a specialized field. There's, um, whether you like it or not, there's, what, there's at times a lot of math, coding, et cetera, that goes into it. Not everyone wants to do that. Typically, the people that do that are nerds. So um, I say that fondly. Um, so in, in this particular field, something that I've kind of learned if you want to go the, the uh, academia research route, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, um, I've kind of learned along the way that getting your degrees at, at multiple institutions seems to be beneficial. I said this my two cents. To kind of expand on my thoughts on this, um, uh, another thing to consider is uh, don't be afraid to think abroad with any graduate studies. Um, I know we here that are natural U.S. citizens probably take it for granted, uh, but there's a lot of people, as you've probably gone through your grad class, and you realize there's a lot of international students that come over. Um, we can very much go the other way. There's a lot of good international research universities, you know, Delft and a huge one that's very, very prestigious in this particular field. And with, with the more and more of it being a global economy versus segmented economies, uh, you have a lot more uh, consulting companies like Mine, for example, that's an international consulting company, um, having that sort of diversification is, is, is considered very valuable. My last thing, and, and it's kind of, it is really the biggest thing in my personal experience that, that uh, um, I feel like I can pass on, is that if, if you do go to grad school route, master's, PhD, what have you, in my personal
personal opinion, probably more so than the actual school you go to, find a good advisor you fit with. Most of the, and I, and I, I know that sounds trivial, I know you say duh, but I've seen way too many instances where a student will just blindly apply to a university, through the admissions process, they kind of get hooked up with an advisor and their stuff, for lack of a better term. There is a big difference in the way advisors treat your students, unfortunately, there is. So in my experience, your advisor will absolutely make or break your educational experience. You know, if you have an advisor that will push you, but you have supportive and rewarding, you'll get the most out of that and will set yourself up for success in the future. It's, you know, with that, you know, because it's so critical, like I said, don't just, you know, blindly apply and, you know, go with this person because they that particular professor kind of is in the general field I want to study. Treat it like a job interview. Do some research. Get to know uh, the pot potential advisor. Talk to the current or former students when you can. Treat it like a job interview. Most students do not do that, in my experience. You know, typically, if you go to PhD, if you're a master's, you go to PhD, you probably learned that lesson. But please put time into doing that. Um, I think, like I said, having a good advisor probably more valuable than this would be long term. Kind of leads me to the next stage in the career growth, if you will, and that's finding the job. And this is kind of the, the transition of wrapping up your studies, applying for jobs, etc. You know, the chances are you don't really have any, I hate to use this term real world experience, I, I don't want to use real world because, you know, you guys are getting through day to day, not making much money as college students living on front noodles. It doesn't get more real world than that. Um, but when you're kind of developing your resume and applying for, again, I'm kind of focusing this just on, on jobs in this particular area. Uh, highlight any coursework you've done in that. Um, one thing that I've seen that, that um, I've seen most people, and by the way, I'm, I'm in my position now for, for the last year or so, I've been in a position of hiring people. I've seen students that have grad school experience do good at this. They don't do good at this. Sell your thesis. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that people will just state their thesis on their resume. I think it's more valuable or more impactful if you kind of sell it to a degree. Um, you know, state uh, any new software programs or, or program languages you've learned along the way. You know, like I said, it's a project. So you're working with other people, any other uh, uh, project collaborators, you know, that, that sort of teamwork, collaboration with other people. Um, any technical publications that come from it, you know, typically when you do a thesis, they'll usually lead to some sort of uh, uh, conference proceedings or, or uh, a journal article. Um, sell that. I mean, that's high level technical writing. And speaking from experience, very few. I think also, along with that thesis, if you present it at uh, presentations associated with that, you know, you've gone to international conferences or national conferences, you've given presentations on it, that's another skill. Sell the fact that you've done that. Um, it is public speaking is a skill that you absolutely have to keep trying every time you give a presentation to do something better than the last time. Uh, public speaking, typically, engineers are not very good. Something to keep trying, you know, show that on the resume that you kind of put time into understanding that's a valuable thing to learn and grow on that. Also, speaking from experience, if you can get up in front of a technical group, give a presentation that this, uh, the audience takes something away from it, they learn something, uh, it's clear within a 15, 20 minute time frame, you just pull out a conference. I, I think that shows an absolute command of the material. Uh, if you're able to versus just take a test on it. So, you know, it may not seem obvious, but it's a much different level of mastery of material if you can talk about it. Uh, some other aspects, um, when you go to apply for jobs, don't be afraid to relocate. Um, you know, the, this is, uh, um, you know, it, it's much more so than it used to be. You know, you don't have to be 
confined to one area. Um, so they're, 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 you know, please consider, you know, if you're in Florida, there might be excellent jobs out in California, Pacific Northwest, Texas, what have you. Um, be willing to move if you can. Um, but research, when you start applying, but research into whatever company or agency, uh, university, if you're going to academia, um, prior to your interview. When you get to the inter interview, this, this is kind of daunting, it takes a little bit of self-confidence, but don't be afraid to ask any tough questions on your end. Um, you know, it, it, it may not seem like it when you're going through the process, but treat it like you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Um, trust me, I, I'm with you in the fact that most people think salary and benefits are, are what matter. They do. Obviously, you got to support family. Um, but I think long-term success that's often overlooked is interview, are you, um, do you respect the people you're interviewing with, do you find it a couple of easy conversations with people, um, being able to get along long term, I think, has, has a good benefit. The other thing that I've kind of found people uh, getting themselves in trouble, not in trouble, like, gotcha during the interview, but um, it's kind of down the road, is don't overly exaggerate on your resume, you know, going through your studies, if you say you, um, you know, just an example, let's say, for a class, you got to learn MATLAB, for example. More than likely for that one class, if you get a class project done, you probably learn the basics of MATLAB just to get in and out, get your A, and move on. If you're defining, if you're applying for a job that lists that, you know, what's programming skills, list MATLAB as one of them. Don't put on your resume that you know MATLAB well from that one. Um, if you get hired day one, you're gonna get a project and you're also going to be kind of be lost and your boss will be looking at you like I hired you to do this and you can't do it kind of thing. So uh, just be wary. Um, I don't mean to over dramatize that, but just you know, say that if it's not if you're if you know a little bit about it, don't say you're an expert if you're not that kind of thing. <coughs> Any questions along the way? Kind of moving on to um, the next phase, so you've got hired on, you're now in the workforce. Um, I would say I'm not going to harp on a particular system. Just please be organized with your work, whatever works for you. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to be organized to where someone can walk into your office or log onto your computer and easily find something that you're working on um, necessarily. But, but I think you know, if you're working on something, someone says, "Hey, can you send me this?" You know. Should be able to relatively easily retrieve a file and send it without wasting a lot of time. Um, so whatever system works for you, I'm not advocating a particular system, but just, just try to stay organized with your work uh, so you're not confusing people and you're not wasting a lot of time. This is I put this in because this is my pet peeve. Response to emails when someone sends an email. Um, you know I find it extremely irritating if I'm working with someone on a project and I send them an email and say, hey, can you do this for me? And a day, two days goes by, I don't get any type of email response back. And maybe it's something because I, they're working on it and it's a multi-day task, whatever. Some sort of communication back that I know you got that. You know, so I know that you're working on it. I'm not left kind of getting irritated going, what's going on here? Or worse, I assume you're working on it. A week goes by and you haven't been. You know, you might be busy with other stuff and you have to prioritize and you don't communicate that to me. Um, so I, I kind of find it a little bit of a pet peeve when people don't respond to emails. With that, you know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Um, I don't think you need to clog people's email boxes, you know, email inboxes up with, hey, what you doing today? Um, anything like that, or if you're just kind of sending jokes back and forth or if you're trying to work something out on a project. Maybe there's confusion, they keep shooting emails back and forth, just pick up the phone call and have a two minute conversation. Another thing I can, a piece of advice I can say is uh, be patient, open to other people's ideas. Um, I've actually personally found this to be very valuable in the last year or so for me. Um, in my experience, you know, the person you're working with may not be in your particular field per se, um, but I think you stick. Smart people in the room that are willing and 
open to working together, you actually achieve stuff pretty cool as a result of it, in my opinion. Um, you know, so don't, just don't be closed-minded when it comes to that. Just because someone is in your field doesn't mean they don't have an idea or concept you can't benefit from if you put your heads together. Next thing is, uh, particularly for your consulting, but in general, don't sit at your desk and just wait uh, for your boss to come by and get you work. Um, be proactive, get out there. If you hear rumors or projects come down the pipeline, ask about it, get out in front of it. Take ownership of the work you do. Um, you know, if you take pride in what you do, you will get, um, you have a lot better chance to succeed if you take pride in it. You know, one of the things I'm kind of advising here, I'm talking about building a career, not a job. Different things. Building a career, you're wanting to keep advancing, it interests you, you take pride in what you do. A job, you show up at punch in at eight, punch out at five, you know, um, and that's it. You, know, you don't really try to do beyond what you're asked to do. You know, what I'm talking about is building a career. Um, meaning you're keep building on what your past experiences are, you keep getting to that next level, you keep pushing yourself. And I think if you take pride and take ownership of your work, that helps. With that, though, because sometimes, you know, you get a little tomato in your face. Sometimes you make a mistake. Own up to it. Um, you know, don't hide from it. Don't try to skirt the issue. Own up to it. Fix it. Get it back to your client or boss or whatever. It, it's, uh, it can sometimes be tough. It sometimes can be punch in the gut. But uh, believe it or not, if you do that, because few people honestly are able to do that, honestly, and, and stand there and take it, they made a mistake. If you do that and do the right thing and fix it, a lot of times the other person will actually respect you more for it. Um, so just a piece of advice. Nothing, uh, this may seem a little confusing, but when, when you're working, and this is really more focused on the consulting aspect, but you know, know what you know and know what you don't know. Um, you know, if someone asks you to do something, you know, if you have literally no idea what to do or where to start, you know, know that you can't do that. Speak up, say that, communicate it, so we can figure something out and work together. Um, do not say, I got this, or okay, if you don't know where, you, where to start, nobody benefits, you know, then the project doesn't, doesn't get done, and we both look bad. Um, so I, I know it kind of seems a little weird um, saying that, you know, but it's also about managing risk and doing that and you keep trying to do stuff, you know, bite off more to eat than you can chew, um, you know, you're going to kind of blame out pretty bad, I think. Um, you know, it's about, you know, it, but that's different than, you know, you know a field, you, you, you think, you know, if something's just an extension of what you already know, you need to kind of push yourself a little bit to get to that next level. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, don't try to be overly impress your boss and try to do something you can't do. More uh, general tips, um, there's no substitute for hard work. Um, you know, I don't mean you have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I mean, there's a smart way to work, uh, but the fact of the matter is you're going to have to put in the time it, it takes to do the job. Um, officially, you get paid for 40 hours. Unofficially, nobody works 40 hours. Um, it's a fact. It's an unfortunate Some weeks can be busier than others, but you know it kind of goes into taking pride in what you do. If you take pride in what you do, you're not going to be afraid to kind of work late at night to make sure that the project is done right, or uh, you, know, you get something back to someone so they don't have to wait on you, kind of thing. Um, you know, along the way, try to continually uh, evolve your skill set. You know, if you don't, the market will leave you behind. You know, if you you know, graduate, um, give my example. I graduated, I had much more experience programming in Fortran than I did MATLAB. You get out more and more programs along the way, uh, these customized tools are MATLAB, so I've had to kind of force myself to sit down and learn MATLAB better than I did in order to use those tools. If not, I wouldn't be able to use them. So, you know, keep trying to evolve your skill set along the way. 
I said this before, don't you know, be afraid to collaborate with others or meet open to new ideas. And I know these are kind of cliche, but plan your work, work the plan. Um, failing the plan is plan to fail. Um, kind of cliche statements, but they're true. Any questions for that part of the talk? Anybody? You know, if you're treating it just like a job where you're just kind of punching in, punching out, you know, paycheck, you're more inclined to kind of just do it, pass it off, be done, and not want to see it again. Um, I think you'll have more success and get promoted if you take ownership of work. Um, you know, a lot of times in this in this field of hydraulic engineering, you know, and the hydraulic has multiple options. It has coastal hydraulics. Environmental stuff, there's a lot of different options. Um, with that, since you're so specialized, you know, you'll work on a project, and I'll show you a couple projects here in a little bit um, that aren't your cookie cutter, you know, box, simple, neat, typical type of projects. Usually they're all different. And I kind of have always had the feeling that if I work on a project for six months, nobody in the world should be. Because you know all the benefits I said of a of a master of a master's thesis are magnified with a PhD dissertation. Um, there, you're truly doing new works on top of doing um, on top of the whole. You know, you got to plan your work, you got to organize it, you got to work with others, you got to get it done by certain deadlines. Um, you're doing stuff that no one else has ever done, and you have to do that, digest it, write about it, present about it at a very very high level. Skills there that last a lifetime that you can make up for the missed years of consulting. Doesn't that make you overqualified for a lot of job opportunities? Yeah, like I said, I'm speaking about one particular field, hydraulic engineering. I, my experience is in this type of field, um, it, it's, it's such a niche field because there's a lot of math, there's a lot of programming, um, a lot of modeling. Stuff that um, you have to sit down and think about. It's stuff that will, on a daily basis or weekly basis, you want to take your computer and chuck it out the window. Um, so, it, it, because of that, it's not something everyone can do. And it's kind of the way the market's going, even in consulting, is because it's becoming more specialized, you're going to more and more specialty groups to do it. And I think having a PhD makes it yourself more specialized. Having said that, A lot of different. Uh, more here, I come up with a better analogy, but you know, just because you're focusing on one thing doesn't mean you shouldn't try to learn other aspects around it. You know, like uh, you know, if you get a PhD, you know, you might be ultra focused on one thing, um, but maybe you know, if you're doing hydrodynamic modeling, maybe uh, try to figure out a way to. I didn't bore you to death with that. Um, I'll show a couple projects.
interesting with the more branching of these will. Um, these are a couple presentations that, that I have given at uh, various public meetings and conferences. Um, they're kind of condensed, though. I kind of cut out some slides, so not all the information is there, but you'll still be able to get the gist. The first one is <coughs> looking at the influence of, of sea ice, ice cover on storm surge. So I know if people are working this lab, know background, you know, up in the Arctic Ocean, you may or may not have seen various news reports here and there, uh, but there's a lot of oil and gas interest up in the Arctic Ocean. And so the uh, Canadian government uh, that paid for this study um, had kind of been doing these, these uh, long-term studies to kind of come up with uh, statistics on waves and water levels and winds and that kind of thing. So they had already completed these uh, wind and wave climatology studies. There's 30 plus years of continuous high testing. Recognize the need to uh, incorporate water level, the tide, astronomical tides, storm surge, that kind of thing. So here's the study area. Again, this is the northern coast of Alaska here. Here's the uh, divide between Alaska and Canada and the northern uh, coast of Alaska. The uh, North Pole is just up here. <coughs> this is that latitude, 87. Uh, area of interest. Here's the uh, funded element national belt. So for those of you who don't matter, these triangles, if you will, uh, they're way of doing it. lines of communication is a big way of doing it. Computer computes equations of motion from one to the other vertically along, along the triangle. This is a relatively high resolution mesh for this type of study. It has about 303,000 nodes. Here's a bathymetry DM. DM uh, stands for digital elevation model. Uh, the darker the colors, the deeper it is, the lighter the colors, the shallower it is. So it kind of just shows you the transition there. When you develop a model, you have to validate it. Or not have to. If you, if you have the ability to, you can need to, which validated means compare model results to any measured data so you know that you're producing results of one. With this study, we had three NOAA tight gauges. 35 DFO stations. Uh, DFO is the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which is the uh, Canadian uh, agency. And out of all those stations, the, because really the main area of interest was lived down here in this area here. And out of all those yellow stars, there's one that had reliable long term data that we compared to. And it seems like a fun word to say, a toy tech, or a tuck for short. We use the asterisk model long wave coastal circulation model, uh, find an element based, and primarily used to simulate tides and storm surge. Just got to show you a brief example of uh, uh, tide validation. Here's uh, one of those NOAA gauges. New results are modeled, black and historical. historical. You see there's a very good match, um, meaning model results are practically on top of the, the historical data. Uh, a pretty good fit. So, kind of felt the model was pretty well validated, there, and there's other results, I'm just showing you one, just to kind of keep it brief, that the, uh, the models perform well for tides, typically it's performing well for tides, yes. Why do you have four different frequencies in the first part and the second part? It, it's just the, uh, the natural harmonics of the tides. So this is a, um, uh, so you have the water level data and then you do a FOIA analysis, come up with uh, harmonic constituents just happens to, you, you then resynthesize each, each of those harmonic constituents 
over a full spring deep tidal cycle. And it just happens to be that the various nonlinearities of form kind of show up uh, at that point in the cycle. So when you validate tides, typically that gives you pretty good comfort that your underlying bathymetry is well represented in the model and your boundary conditions are well. Uh, so we move on to the next type of case, which is uh, one thing you can validate for storm surge. And we're going to keep it simple initially, which is these are uh, what's called open water conditions, uh, meaning there's not um, there's no adjustments to the ice cover. You know, this is late summer, you know, August. You know, it's warmer out there, relatively speaking. Ice, the ice pack is kind of moved away, um, so it's turned to open water conditions. So here again, we have the the shortcut data. This now, this is not uh, um, resynthesized harmonic constituents. This is actual measured data, which is shown in black. The blue results are the model. Uh, again. This was a good event to, to validate to because it's a pretty isolated event. Nothing really going on. There's a significant front coming through, and then uh, you know, then it goes back to normal. You know, obviously, they don't have hurricanes up in the Arctic Ocean. This is just a, a strong frontal system moving through. But nevertheless, it kind of provided a nice isolated event to validate to. And overall, we thought that was a pretty good comparison. But like I said, as you can imagine, up in the Arctic Ocean quickly have ice most months of the year, uh, some of which when you get to very, very cold months, very, very thick ice. Um, fortunately, the Canadian government, um, we did have ice cover data available, uh, stretching across the five kilometer grid um, that we could use. And the important thing to know is that the key thing to this is they're wanting to, to come up with a long-term database is what they want to use as model for. So because of that, there's a distinct difference between calibrating the model versus parameterizing it. If you were to just do one event and you're only concerned about one event, you can keep tweaking model parameters all day long to eventually get the results you want if you're only interested in that one event. If it has to affect multiple years of data, multiple events, you get it into, you need to realistically, physically describe well parameterize it accordingly. You know, because of that, we needed some sort of flexible way to represent conditions where there's no ice, where there's some ice, full ice, you know, kind of broad spectrum. So just kind of show you coverage of, of, of ice cover. This is just an example on September 1980. The doesn't really show up too well. Uh, but you have the, the darker red, oranges and reds, means you have a higher percent coverage of ice. So pretty much, you know, 100% means that area is just fully covered in ice. And go down to the dark blues, purples, you get down into uh, the um, less ice down to zero percent meaning it's open water conditions. You see it here along the coast, not much ice. Out in the ocean, you can see the ice pack uh, kind of out there. So I'm going to kind of step through weekly snapshots of this. Go to the next week, see the change in it. So next week again, see the continual change. Next week, see some significant change in the ice pack starting to move down. So with that, um, and this is, people think I'm joking when I say this, um, the Army Corps at the time we are doing the study came up with, with a some sort of experimental method to represent ice <coughs> in these types of models. And because us nerds think we're always wittier than we are, uh, they aptly named it the ice cube method. Um, I know, ha ha. Um, what it does is it, it, it assumes that the ice flow uh, contributes to the momentum of the water column and the wind's pushing it up to a certain point. It actually maximum for maximize, uh, maximizes that 50% coverage of ice. So when you have 50% ice cover, yeah, that's when you have the maximum momentum of the, the wind flowing. The wind is blowing above the water surface. It's pushing the ice, and that in turn is pushing the water as it goes along. And when you go down beyond 50% beyond ice cover, it begins to tail back down um, to the uh, normal conditions. Now, one thing that, that uh, in my opinion, I was able to prove with the study is this is something the Army Corps did, but what, what this is saying is that when you have 100% ice cover, so ice everywhere, that's the same as no ice. And I contend that does not physically make sense. You know, if you have ice coverage, and I'll show that, I'll prove that in a little bit, that if you have ice everywhere, that's a defined barrier between 
the wind and the water surface, and it just doesn't push the water the same. But using this method, it says it's the same. So just keep that in mind. So that same 1980 time, September 1980 time period, we applied the ice cube method. You may re recall the, the variation from ice. The fall time, the September and October time frame up near the Earth is extremely volatile. Uh, you can see just the, the constant significant swings in the overall uh, water column. But the model actually captures that very well. Uh, so we feel like that, you know, this was, and there's other examples where we ran that kind of showed similar type of conclusion. Now, in back to that 100% ice cover thing. On top of that, there's different kinds of ice. I know it seems strange. Uh, there's ice flow, which you see here, which is kind of broken up, segmented packs of ice moving with the wall, you know, so if water current's moving, it's moving with the water current. That is different than fast ice. You have short fast ice, bottom fast ice. And this type of ice, and I don't know if it's on TV anymore, but do you guys recall ice road truckers, the TV show, where you're literally driving uh, semi-trucks? This study, this model made is actually where some of the ice road truckers was filmed. So we're talking about ice that's so thick, you can drive a semi-truck on it all day long. So, unfortunately, the ice cube method assumes this. It doesn't account for this. So, what I did is, unfortunately, there's not a real easy way to adjust this. This is an ice chart that the Canadian government produces. It's a godly good full of mess. And it does inherently make no sense whatsoever. But just kind of orient yourself. It, like, this is a bit rotated relative to your shorelines running this way as opposed to the orientation of the model you saw before. Uh, but that's the station that we primarily have data at. It's in this classification zone B. This is the, this is called an ice egg. I know. Uh, but this these numbers apparently mean something. And this bottom one in particular, if it's an eight, it means it's fast ice. So during this time period, or at this one example in December 08, there's fast ice in this coastal zone, meaning this ice you can drive over. So here's that December 08 time period. What do, what do you notice in the historical data? Even though you have that blanket thick ice, what do you notice in the historical data? There's still some sort of change in water elevation there. <coughs> Doesn't seem intuitive even though you have real thick ice there. When we applied the ice cube data, horribly dramatically overpredicted a little bit. Because again, all that ice assumed it was still free flowing. Uh, no loss of momentum energy between the wind and the, the water surface. So what I did just as a, a trial and error to see if it worked is I, I took the model, wherever the model intersected the zone of fast ice, I zeroed out the wind speed. So I assumed that there's no wind blowing out of the water. That significantly improved the results, but still something's missing at this point. Um, but nevertheless, I think it was on the right track. And unfortunately, at that point, funny stuff, I couldn't go to the next one. Um, now, I, this is coming from a presentation that uh, I gave at a conference called the Wave Workshop last year. Um, coincidentally, I gave this whole talk. You know, I've been racking my brain for a couple years on, on how to solve this. Um, not continually, you know, but this, this was actually kind of limited fun to fund the study. And I gave this talk in uh, Johannes Westry. Developer of the model that did this, and he actually su suggested a very simple uh, thing to look at that I just funny stuff so I had a chance to look at it, and that's maybe uh, with limiting the uh, the wind stress, maybe there's when there's the presence of ice present, um, the wind drag coefficient, which uh, I'm kind of more speaking to the abstract crowd here, um, that has a lower limitation as to what that can reach. So instead of 0.035, maybe it's 0.02. This is just a, a frontal system moving through. So even though there, there's miles and miles of ice in front of this gauge, I mean, this gauge is it's hard, hard to, 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 to read, but this gauge is 
separated by 10 to 15 miles of thick ice you can drive over. And even with that, there's still the event showing up in, in the water surface that this due to some frontal system moving through. So unfortunately, this is still somewhat work in progress. So switching gears, my, my um, next project uh, doesn't have to do with ice, it still has to deal with the school and church. Um, this is for a public presentation we gave to the, to the uh, NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission last year. Um, it's for a uh, PSG power company up in New Jersey is trying to build a new nuclear power plant and they need to know how high to build it. Uh, so they need to know how high the flood level is. And I know you guys are taking you guys, uh, have you taken water resources yet? Are you guys familiar with uh, what return period means? Like you have a 100-year flood level or a 25-year flood level, that kind of thing. For this project, we have a complete million-year flood level. So it's a bit abnormal. So there's a lot of information that's kind of uh, cut out of here, but you know, I'm just going to kind of stick to uh, some of the more interesting aspects. Um, we used a couple of asterisk and swans. Asterisk is the hydrodynamic model, swans, wave model. So we use a version of those two that this couple is communicating back and forth with each other. And here we have the, uh, the, the model domain that was used for it. This was, uh, fortunately, we were able to lean on our partners that did uh, some recent work for FEMA in this area. So we were able to kind of politely ask for this model to give it to us. Um, the PSDG site, like I said, is up here in Delaware Bay. South New Jersey. Again, here you have Delaware Bay, and the nuclear power plant site is right there. So 
can see, again, this is the finite element mesh that, that you kind of saw before. Um, the, you can kind of see it looks like this, it gets to the point where it looks like it's just uh, black, essentially. Um, it's, it's still discretized, like you have out here with these triangles. Uh, it's just black at this scale. It's at such a high resolution. These triangles are all condensed down. It looks like you can't see them at this scale. Uh, so we have all this floodplain and, and the Chesapeake Bay over here, Delaware Bay over here, um, including one that has 2 million computational nodes. And here you have the model boundary showing all this floodplain that, that describes this model. Zooming in a little bit more, this is the PSHC site. Salem Hope Creek site. So you have the existing power plant right here, and the existing power plant has three nuclear generating stations. It has the Hope Creek unit right here, it has Salem Unit 1 here, and Salem Unit 2 there. They currently have three nuclear generating stations on, on site. And they're wanting to build a fourth new one. The, this slide is called PSD site, somewhere up here. All this is for a glorified conceptual plan. So don't know exact details yet as to how it's going to look up there. They just know that the new plant's going to be up there. And what they're going to do with this new plant is build it up, the base of it up to where it is a foot above the highest design basis flood zone. So being able to be accurate, being able to be accurate while not being overly conservative is important because take all this infrastructure like here and build it up. These, these aren't built up. These are these are terms of wet stations, so they're designed to, to potentially be flooded. Um, if you were to build this up, every time you build it up above grade, it costs $10 million. So there's a huge price tag associated with this. So being, having to be accurate, yet not overly conservative. Because the tendency is to go overly conservative and say you don't have to worry about it. Well, you keep rounding up, and whatever numbers you do, you just cost them $50 million. So, you need to be prudent with what you do. So, what was this leaf thing there? This? This? Oh, that's nice. So, that's the this? This one? That is, that's a cooling tower for this reactor. So, you see these big cooling towers, you got the steam coming out of it. That's the cooling, cooling tower associated with this one. These, these two down here have a different. Here's the uh, DEM of the terrain of the area. You have high, over, high ground up here, which is actually the, where they put some spoil piles way back when. Interesting, actually, before I get to this, all this, all these facilities were built on what's now co called artificial island. It's called artificial island, but it doesn't actually exist. Back in the 70s, they threw a whole bunch of dirt out there, actually dredged to Delaware River, Delaware Bay, threw a whole bunch of dirt out there to create this new island. One thing I thought was interesting is uh, that island was not within any state boundary when it was built. And when it was built, Delaware and New Jersey got into a huge fight over who owns that land because nuclear power station, many years operating, huge tax dollars associated with it. Well, New Jersey won. So somebody around the 1970s took the eraser to the official state boundary. They raised it and made it, <coughs> made it silent and decided to live in New Jersey and tax dollars. Anyway, so this is DEM. So again, the darker the browns, the higher the elevation, down to dark blues, lower the elevation. This is a picture of the site, the existing site. So here's that cooling tower. You just have to up. This one up here is the Hope Creek Station, and you have two Salem stations. One thing you'll notice, you see here, running through here, that's a bunch of barge ships that were purposely sunk. You know, these, when they created this island, you know, they took all this dirt out here, loaded them up on these barge ships, and filled in here. For whatever reason, I don't know why, I don't know if they just didn't know what to do with barge ships when they were done, but they, they sunk these barge ships, and it goes all the way over here, goes out, goes around, and connects up to the land up here. Interesting though, what that effectively does is it's, it's effectively a breakwater. So it's interesting because at high tides, the high tides these things are submerged, at low tides they're exposed. 
sure why they decided to uh, actually create a whole new island for it. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, I don't know if they, for whatever reason at the time, they were wanting to build this so far away from, from civilization that they wanted to create a certain buffer. Because this is about at least five miles in every direction away from anything. So I don't know if that had to do with it. I'm not sure. So, you know, I thought these like rock, rock revetments and berms. You also had here zooming in. So this is, I'm going to zoom in to over here. This is a water intake structure. So water goes in here, feeds the nuclear generating process. We also have these sheet pile walls along here that are engineered and designed up to certain elevations. So you got to represent that crest elevation as well. So you know you, you take whatever topo elevation you have. Fortunately, we have some recent high resolution lidar data we can, we can feed into the model. We also have you know, with, with some features like this, you guys know what I mean by LiDAR data? You guys heard that term? You know, some of you have, some of you may not. Well, LiDAR data, you have, you have airplanes that will fly over, they're beaming, I'm going to do uh, first grade level description because that's all I know. Beams, uh, laser beams down at some frequency and it bounces up. When it hits something, whether it be rock, tree, ground, it bounces the signal back up, yada, 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 it converts it to elevation information. Well, even with that, and so with that, you know, like a, a, a one square mile will have millions and millions of data points associated with that elevation. Even with that data, though, it's not going to consistently pick up the feature like that. So if you go back, see down here, that's this rock revetment. But even with the LiDAR data, it doesn't really show that sheet pile seawall. It doesn't show this in it. It's just so skinny, it just didn't pick it up. So you have to then rely on, I know you can't see this, it's not meant for you to read it, but just kind of show you, you know, we have to rely on construction drawings, as built, to pull off certified elevations for those crest, that crest information and, and build that to the model. So with that, we have the um, revised model domain. Uh, you can see here, you have line of nodes along that, there's these structures along, along the, the boundary as well as other topographic features. Once we had that, that established, you know, there's whole validation in it that was kind of similar without the ice to the other model, so I'm not going to uh, go into that in much detail. But once we had that tool in place, a model is all it is is a tool, something for you to use to get data. Um, once we had it working the way we wanted to, then we had to then take it and figure out a way to get the million years level. With that, we did a, it's called the joint probability method, method optimum. And joint probability method is kind of applied how it sounds. You're, you're joining multiple probabilities to each other. If this variable has a probability, this variable has a probability, multiply them together to joint probability. But that's what is difficult with probability. 
Here, steps in this method, you had to you know, determine storms that needed to be simulated. You had to develop the wind fields associated with those storms. You had to simulate those surge and wave fields. Estimate the surge response function. From that, estimate the probabilities for those storm parameters when it's these synthetic, synthetic storm events. You integrate those over a multi-dimensional integral and include different effects of uncertainty into it. Yada, yada, yada. You get your 10 to minus 6. So, you know, in order for you to do that, you have to know what variables to adjust to, to know how to relate to probabilities. So, you know, what goes into a hurricane, um, you know, the, the, you know, lots of research has gone in, and, and probably just from looking at news reports, you know, that the social pressure associated with it is key. That's how strong it is. Um, you know, your, your central pressure um, goes into a lot of the factory and how fast the wind speed's going to go. You know, the angle that storm comes up against the coast or your area of interest affects um, how much surge is produced. You know, it's going from this angle or that angle. You know, it can be sheltered or unsheltered to certain features that uh, certain features that matters. The size or radius of maximum winds are important, as well as the land latitude of landfall. Um, you know, there's some other factors like river discharge, something called the Holland B. Um, you need to factor in, but I'm not really going to focus on those. Interesting to note, um, and this goes into where, an example, you have to be careful in how you apply statistics in a scenario like this. You know, we're trying to come up with a million-year return period for this study, so a flood over a million years, you know, very, very extremely low probability of occurrence. You know, if you recall a couple years ago, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, whatever way you want to call it, hit this area. Sandy was actually a million year storm for this area. Anybody tell me why? Probably not. Sounds like a rhetorical question. Um, one of the factors that goes into the probability of the storm is the track angle associated with it. The marker here. In this area, track angle for historical storms like that. Heading up 22 degrees east of north. Sandy came up over like that. Eight standard deviations away from the mean. Probability space, extraordinarily low probability of occurrence. So because of this one factor, can in a way be described as a million year event. But it only produced a surge at the side of nine feet. It didn't breach the site at all. So a little bit of disconnect there and this gets back to what I'm saying. You gotta kind of frame these studies in ways where you you're getting the numbers you want to look at appropriately. And actually that probability right there screwed up a tremendous amount of FEMA work that was going on in Came up with all these synthetic storm events, ran 60 plus storm events. See all these red lines going up? These are tracks of storms. So we have a storm start up here, that way, and down here, or that way, etc. I can see it's kind of getting back to what I'm saying, framing the, the, the study in a way to kind of produce, um, you know, along the lines of what you need. You know, these are, you know, Delaware Bay is oriented this way, angle Delaware Bay. Um, so we can frame the different an the angle, the window of angles of storm events to be like a worst case scenario for the Delaware Bay. Um, you know, so each of these red lines is a different storm event that we simulated and we take results from. So we simulate each of those events, you see different scales, here's the surge coming in the Atlantic Ocean, with the max surges in Delaware Bay and then around site. Same thing with the waves, the different scales. We do that for each storm event. Get a maximum surge at the site, you know. But but the in, in the coast area, when you're dealing with the design flood level, 
you have storm surge, you have tides you're going to worry about, um, sea level rise you're going to worry about, um, then you also have wave runoff you're going to worry about. And that all equates into a design basis total water level. Total water level is a combination of all those into one number. So we had to come up, using, using that information, I had to come up with wave, new wave, wave runoff calculations to eventually get a total water level for the design basis. So wave runoff. Model that this is the Swan model of waves at different sites. This is this equation I'm not going to bore you with. Go into the coastal engineering manual, which is the, the Bible for a lot of these um, coastal engineering types of the calculations. But the concept of what I was going to say is you have the site, and what we did is we put an output point at each side of the site. And then, say, as an example, um, you know, what if a wave were coming in from this easterly direction and traveling in going to the west? Well, in that case, there's different ways of doing this. Um, we could have gone in here and put this big mound into the model, rearranging all the storms all over again to come up with a design model compared to, um, to, to avoid this step. But, you know, there's budgets, there's time frame. Sometimes you got to kind of skip to the final step. Um, so, what we did is, you know, wave comes is coming in this way. What that would mean is you have wave front up on this side, and we'll say this wave angle was so oblique it didn't impinge on the, on the side at all. So again, kind of looking at the historical or looking at model results, here you have this is the surge. So at each of those four points, this is a surge hydrograph produced at each of those. But this is just for example storm. So you take that this time series surge information. We didn't have a time series of the wave heights at each of those points. Using the various equations and adjustments for wave angles relative to each side, we didn't have a time series of wave runup. So this solid black line is the western point. You see here it goes and it just kind of drops off where it, where it goes to nothing. At this is it, this is that angle correction I was saying. The wave was so oblique that this is not impinging on the side, creating a route. So it kind of drops off and it starts back up and starts repeating. Combine this time series, add it to the still water surge time series, you get a time series of the total water level on the site. You then take the maximum of that, and that's your maximum total water level of each one. And you get a big one table looking like this. So restore it in, you get max surge, max total water level. Um, you know, you kind of take all that information, uh, other, other effects that I'm kind of skipping over here, you know, adding in tides, probabilistically, river discharge, hogging force speed. You then can produce what are called response surfaces. They, they kind of look like this. Um, just kind of showing you the different, uh, in this case, you have different uh, angles, different radius, maximum winds, all kind of plotted on one plot. The, the general, general equation for computing um, what goes into the, the beta max or max water surface is a, a function of all these different things. Um, and that's a fun equation. Pull it all down, you get this fun exponential integral. I didn't do this part, that's why I'm kind of glossing over it. Once you do that, you have to add in the effect of uncertainty in what you're doing. You know, there's probability, the other side to it is your good friend uncertainty. Um, you have two types of uncertainty. You have you have epistemic uncertainty, which I kind of think of it as the uncertainty of what you know, so you can quantify, you know, the uncertainty in your variables, and you have aleatory uncertainty, which is the uncertainty of what you don't know. So with that, plug, plug, you know, plug and chug in a very advanced code, and you get a um, line of, of, of uh, on the y-axis, you have occurrences per million years, and on the x-axis you have surge level. So you get the million year flood level, you get this 1.0, so it's the number of current, one occurrence per million years. You go over, if you don't include aleatory uncertainty, you get a number of about 5.9 meters. If you include aleatory uncertainty, you get 6.6 meters. This is just a relationship. Well, you know, you saw that I, I computed total water level, still water level. Um, you know, that, that was, those were deterministic calculations. You got to relate those to the probability space. Do a regression equation, you see that there's an extraordinarily tight fit between total water level and still water level. You know, so you can very easily really 
this refreshing announcement is about really introducing much air, and you get the uh, total water level, and then your total water level of 8.3 meters. So, you, you know, with that, you got 86.3 meters, you add the sea level rise to it, and that gives you your, your design basis. And I believe this came out to be um, converted to feet all in was about 31 feet. something just got to give you a little flavor. Um, these are definitely definitely two of your non-typical type of projects, which is all why I kind of want to present them. Um, so, are there any other questions for me on this? But anything? But does this water take into account the carbon No. Uh, that's a different model. Um, it, it was also required for this analysis. Um, this was just a very small part in the overall project. Uh, they had to do a seismic analysis. Offshoot seismic analysis, they do tsunami analysis, uh, all sorts of different things. So this model is not an account for that. It's a different analysis. Uh, this is a couple of points back. But you said you got the model, and then when you added in the aleatory uncertainty, it changed it. How, without getting like too technical, how exactly do you account for that? Is it something that you don't? If I don't know how to explain it, I would. There, there's a, uh, it, 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 unfortunately, it's not a uh, real simple way of doing it, and it's frankly a step in the process. I don't think I fully understand myself at this point. Um, you know, someone else, I did modeling and hydrodynamics, and someone else did probably the statistics aspect. This is, even probably in statistics, this is not trivial probably like that. It's actually pretty difficult. They, you know, he had to write a Fortran code that did a five dimensional. There are ways, uh, really centered in this case, really centered around uh, uncertainty with the central pressure, so that's really the driver of, of how uh, intense the storm is, how strong the storm is. Um, I don't know that. I have to go back and have to go forward and figure out that. So, any other questions?